Bingo was renowned in the past for its thatched buildings. Unfortunately, there has been a reduction in the numbers of thatched cottages and houses that survive. There is also an important social history aspect to the heritage of thatch, from language and folklore to traditional skills. The Fingal Thatch Project 2022 is surveying and recording the surviving buildings and sharing the stories of thatch. I suppose my background uh, will be in construction. I studied construction technology when I left school. So my family were uh, builders. So when I was building, I loved all the old uh, building. So the restoration work, conservation work, preservation work. That eventually led me into just loving old building skills, traditional building skills, dry stone walling, working with lime, and of course with thatch. Um, I'd been away in the States in the 80s for a long time. And you kind of miss things uh, from home. So I'm not originally from Skerries. My mother's people are from Skerries and we've come down here since before I was born. So the thatching was a big shock to me when I came back from the States to see that uh, how many thatched houses around Skerries just had uh, dwindled. They had disappeared. And I heard somebody talking to Anthony Fanning about his dad, Charlie at the time. Charlie was a well-known thatcher in Skerries and Charlie was very sick. Anthony, I heard saying that himself and his brother were trying to keep it going. So I got in touch with them and with Brendan Lynch and uh, Eamon Lynch. They had set up a Thatch Cottage Preservation Society of Fingal. So this was just what I needed. Uh, I decided I joined the society, learn all about the thatched houses in Fingal. Um, we used to help people, so we'd chip in, we'd have a subscription and we'd help people get smoke alarms, etc. Give them advice about the thatch. Um, and it came to just practical stuff, working with Martin Fanning on the weekends, helping people thatch their houses or patch them up. So that really got me interested in it. Uh, I had a good background working on scaffolding. I had a scaffolding ticket, worked on ladders. So it was easy for me to, uh, to actually take up thatching. Uh, I was quite surprised some of the thatching wasn't lasting as long as it should have. So we were looking into materials and that sort of thing. So the whole interest uh, from all my heritage background and heritage interests, I decided that I, I'd become a thatcher. And that's what I did. So I worked with Martin for a while. And uh, the important thing that I'd like to say is that the type of thatching that was done in North County Dublin, they called it slice thatching, S-L-I-C-E. So a slice is a hand tool. It's like a small little hand fork. And that was the tool that actually thatched the roof. So it was a small wooden handle with a long uh, iron bar. And on the top was a little fork, usually half of a chain that was welded on. Um, so the slice was the main tool and uh, it was for taking handfuls of straw, wrapping them up into a little knot and thrusting it in with the slice. So that's the particular type of thatching uh, in North County Dublin. It's also known throughout the West Coast, it even goes in as far as uh, County West Mead, I would have thatched the house there with slice thatching. So unfortunately the, the method of thatching has almost died out, there's very few actually continuing that. There's one thatcher in Kildare doing a bit, uh, maybe one in Wexford as well. And of course, Martin Fanning, when he thatches his uh, father's old house, will use the slice for slice thatching. Uh, what's kind of happened lately is that um, different methods of thatching, which were obviously around uh, in different counties, different parts, uh, it's scallop thatching. So scallop thatching has kind of taken over in the region here. So that's just important to point out for in years to come, if people are researching the thatch and the methods used, that the traditional method would have been um, slice thatching, and now it's gone to scallop thatching. So the scallops, of course, we'd see them on the ridge of a roof, at the very top on the outside, and along the eaves. So it's like hazel rods or willow rods, and the scallop themselves are about a foot and a half long. They're twisted in the middle, like a hairpin, and pointed at the ends, and that actually holds the thatch in. So two different methods. Um, I was training people for FOSS for a few years, so together with the OPW, the Heritage Council, local authorities, we put together um, a training uh, plan. So it was a 51 week uh, touch. Uh, it wasn't an apprenticeship, it was a training course, uh, which involved 16 weeks working with a thatcher as well as classroom theory, conservation stuff, and then the practical work as well. So that ran for two years in Portumna and one year in Waterford. So it's nice, that's really what I, I got best enjoyment out of, was to pass the skills on. But to have these thatchers working in today's, in the modern world, they had to learn different methods and regional styles so that they could take on any type of thatching work. So we'd use different materials like water reed. Um, it has become almost like a global thatch, the water reed, but it was used in Ireland extensively, especially around uh, rivers like the Shannon, where water reed grows, the Blackwater, um, down Waterford and Cork. 
So that type of thatching uh, was there, but it wasn't indigenous to every area. So uh, what I'd like to teach them was that you use reed where reed was grown, you use wheat uh, put on like reed style, um, where that was used as well. And then you'd use scallop thatching or slice thatching. Um, the English call that long straw. We just call it straw thatching here. Um, so they did learn uh, all different types of thatching, uh, even for the west coast, the rope thatching. Uh, the ridges, of course, are different uh, from Donegal down through Mayo, down through the Iron Islands. The ridges are rounded. So all the different types of materials. Uh, they got a small bit of work with flax. Uh, so I've come across flax up in County Monaghan. It's fairly big in the north as well. There's still a thatcher using flax up there. And in Donegal, they use flax. They would have uh, had a couple of samples of heather as well. Uh, which was really no examples of that lasted in houses here in Ireland. But just to give you an idea, that's the way we were training them so that they could do any type of work, whether it was modern rebuild work or conservation work or heritage work. So that was my training part of it and uh, I got great enjoyment out of that. But another aspect of the heritage is the kind of intangible uh, heritage that goes with thatching. So what really amazed me was the words and some of the words that we use in thatching, like other trades and skills, they'll probably be lost. So for example, I mentioned the slice being the tool uh, for thrusting the thatch into the roof. Well, the small little handfuls that you put onto the roof uh, are called wangles, W-A-N-G-L-E-S. And that's a word you don't hear anymore. So a wangle. Uh, I know in Kildare they call them, and in Loud, a fangle. So just a variation on the same word. Um, another word for a slice will be a beater or a beating pin, a thatching fork, um, a spurtle. So there's all different names for these tools, uh, which I think would be a shame if they were lost. Um, and then of course, some Irish words coming in. When I was working in Portumna, they'd call the, uh, the horizontal hazel rods or the willow rods, they'd call them um, gaulyogs. So a gaulyog was like a fork. Um, so different words, they'd call them ledgers, stretchers, um, gads even. So all these names just for the materials and for the tools, I think it's very important that they should be kept as well. And uh, just as regards Fingal, a couple of nice little stories about Charlie Fanning because, because of the Fannings, uh, really, I got my interest in the thatching and it was great to continue it on. Um, but my own mother's cousin, he only died a couple of years ago at 103, Raymond O'Driscoll. Uh, he was a great man. He used to write poems about Fingal and Scaries especially. But he was able to tell me when I told him about Martin um, Fanning and Anthony Fanning, and Martin had a son called Keen. So I was able to say to my mother's cousin, I said, not only let's say you know Keen, but you never met him, but you know uh, his father then would be uh, Martin Fanning. So Martin, of course, being able to thatch, being a thatcher. Um, my mother's cousin knew his father, Charlie, of course, who I met too. He also knew Charlie's father, John, who was a thatcher. He knew John's brothers, Tom, and a couple of other brothers were thatchers. And then their father, Mark uh, Fanning, was a thatcher also. So this goes back five generations, uh, just in a little place like Scarry's. So I think that's a fantastic uh, record to have about the Fannings uh, thatching and that I knew a man who knew five generations of them and they were all thatchers. So uh, a nice bit of heritage there as well, going back in time. He told me a couple of stories about Charlie. Um, Charlie would have been throwing water over the thatch uh, when it's thatched just to settle it down and beat it down so the thatch lies nicely on the roof. And somebody inside the house was saying, Charlie, we're trying to keep the water out, not let it in. Uh, so little stories of that. There was another thatcher around the Scarries area called the Lark Farrell. And apparently the Lark Farrell was doing a job in Scarries somewhere. He didn't tell me which house it was. And uh, he said to the lady, he said, I can't really start now, he said, because an empty sack can't stand. So the lady of the house, of course, gave him some food and he was delighted and he was taking his time getting up on the roof to thatch. And she said, are you going to start thatching now? And apparently he said, well, a full sack can't bend. So uh, just little, little thatching stories uh, about the area. Yeah, so there was plenty, there would have been plenty of thatchers in Rush, uh, Lusk as well, and through the years you'd hear people mentioning them. Um, so it's nice just to put that on record, the people who have gone before us and gave us an interest in it. Um, as I said, I got my interest because I love local history, I love heritage, etc. And then having the building skills to do it. Uh, but the great thing was to be able to pass it on to other people as well. as one Thatcher used to call guts in it. It is that strength in it. And, um, and that's why wheat and straw was, was of, of, of preference. The varieties here, Maris Widgeon, um, Maris Huntsman, Apollo, Squarehead Master, N59, 
and um, and a few others. We will harvest it, we'll keep it separate and that's what we've been doing for 20 years. So there you go. Um, that's 54 inches. This is our thatching wheats. This farm is organic. So there is no artificial nitrogen. There's no artificial fertilizers. This did get some farmyard manure before we plowed it. This is um, a McCormick International binder. It's actually PTO driven. So it's one of the later binders. And we use that quite a bit for cutting thatching straw back in the years when we were at it. So basically this machine, that drops forward, um, the blade cuts, the crop falls onto the canvas, the canvas is ferried across, there's two canvases, one going this way and the top one gathers the crop, unbelievable accuracy, brings it across and presents it to the packers and the packers are packing it and then when there's sufficient pressure builds up on the spring, it trips and on the next rotation the needle comes up and McCormack's famous knot and then the packers come around and throw out the sheaf. Wheat reed is where you get the wheat, you thresh out the ear and you strip off all the leaves. So you have um, a stem and the threshed ear and it is basically um, put on the roof similar to water reed. Wheat and this is critical to the whole wheat oat debate. Um, with wheat, the grain or the straw ripens before the grain. With oats, the grain ripens before the straw. If you go out with a combine into a crop of wheat, the straw is well ripe and the grain is just ripe. And what happens is the straw is brittle and breaks up and is mangled in the whole threshing process. It is what's known as a ransom colonial and it is reputed that this particular machine was bought by the Tsar of Russia and was on its way to Russia uh, in, in 1917 a big event, historical event happened and you have the Russian Revolution and um, they figured well they're never going to get paid so this was in Southampton waiting to be loaded to head to Russia. Uh, word of the Russian Revolution came through, so it never got shipped. So it was reconsigned to go to America. So all ships going to America back in that day would pull into Queenstown, or was at Cove in Cork, and six of these threshing mills were taken off. These were contractors machines, and the reason we have these was for um, threshing, thatching straw. These are what's known as 54 inch machines, which is four foot six. So the idea being that you can feed a, um, a sheaf of wheat or a sheaf of grain into it. Um, and from a thatching point of view, you do, you feed the wheat into the threshing drum completely differently than if you were um, feeding it for just threshing the straw. These new machines that came about were a combined reaper and thresher, which is an awful jawful, and ultimately the word combine uh, morphed into existence. But it basically is taking the two functions of reaping and binding and threshing into one. The disadvantage from a thatching perspective is you have this drum that's spinning at 1200 RPM and now the straw is coming in, it has to bend around, being battered as it does so, before it gets to the walkers. Which is why combine straw is not good for thatching. This is an old, an old cottage, uh, one, of, one of two. One was thatched in 2006 and then this one was basically uh, covered over with tin and inhabited, but the, the roof came off about 90 years ago. So I helped with the research on this to, um, to try and basically find out whether it was thatched. So 
the owner, Owen, um, Owen Darby there, actually found out that it was thatch back in the day. It was a pair of two sitting together. So we've basically um, reinstated the thatch back onto the, the roof as it was like years ago. Most of the cottages that you see around Ireland are, you know, two, three hundred years old. You know, they've been, I mean, any uh, old scrolls of any old villages around Ireland, uh, you know, are, are full of, of thatch buildings. You know, there was hundreds of them. There was more thatch in, in Ireland than anything else. There was hardly any tiled buildings. They were all thatched. So, you know, to keep that heritage going is part of, you know, Fingal's heritage, you know, so uh, it's the same with, with Louth and either any county, we want, you want to keep the thatch going, it's, it's an old tradition, it's an old craft, it's an art, um, it's, not a, uh, it's, not, it's not a trade, people sort of say, oh it's a trade, it's not, it's a craft, it's an art, you know, you're learning a craft and an art, you know, it's, you know, I've been trying to, you know, forward it on with the lads that I've trained over the last, like, 20 years, so um, Darren's another one, it's been with me 10 years, He's got another two years to go, and then uh, my standards are set very high. Um, they had, they have to adhere to my high standards, and you know, eventually they'll, you know, that'll be the ones going forward that keep the heritage going in, you know, in Fingal and Meath and Louth and the other counties. So um, I just try and keep keep it going, you know, to be honest with you. But the thatch overall is it's one of the best insulators you can get. There isn't a, a better insulator than than thatch. Keeps the building warmer in the, in the in the winter, cooler in the summer. So you walk in in the summer, it's nice and cool. Um, the straw is is usually uh, uh, sourced locally if if we can. I mean, I am a grower myself, but which I've stopped doing in the last three or four years. At the minute this stuff on this roof is oats, and it comes from Kildare. So coming this October, I'll be growing again myself wheat, uh, two different varieties of wheat, modern wheat. And, and a heritage grain as well I'll be growing this, uh, this October. So I have machinery for harvesting as well, so um, for the supply to other thatchers as well. So that's what I'll be doing again. So after the roof is done, the initial, the initial uh, first couple of years, you'll find that there's kind of a, a shedding stage after a long straw roof has been done. Um, you've raked the roof out and got it all finished. You're still gonna get little bits falling out. That kind of, when the roof settles down, the shedding part stops and you usually get hairy bits that kind of fall out of the eave as well. So all that has to be trimmed up. And then the main, main part of it is to preserve what you've got there, which is uh, copper sulfate, which a lot of thatchers are not doing, which should be, should be done in all counties really, of any straw thatched roof or any, any material that's grown out the, out the ground and is put onto a roof, it should be treated with copper sulfate. It's, it's a preservative and it will preserve. We do get crow problems, but the crows are, um, it's an easy job to fix. You just get a dead crow. Most, most crows are just looking for a bit of seed. So they'll delve into the roof, but if they've got the blue stone on there, it can deter them. But usually if they don't, they're not deterred, what we do is we get a dead crow and put a dead crow on the back of the roof and that then, they'll then squawk around the place, but they won't land on it. So it's a good deterrent. So, but um, ordinarily, you know, most roofs when they're finished, you might get, you know, mice, rats hanging around, you know, especially when the straw lying about me. And if I was a rat or a mouse or any kind of animal, where would I want to sleep? I'd want to sleep in the straw. And you start off with the eave, you put reed in the eaves because you want the solid base. The scaffold, you, you see it's at this height at the minute, but when you set up on a job, the scaffold is actually set up at a specific height where you can set your base of your straw sitting down on the scaffold. You don't you don't necessarily want the, the scaffold that low down and then working up there because the straw is then hanging too much. You want something solid for it to sit on so you can start the base of your roof. You then go up in layers, working your way across. The principles are the same. Your, your, the setup is the same apart from the fixing point. If it's an old roof, you're, you're, you're scalloping all the, the straw into the eaves. If it's a new roof, you're basically putting metal bars across it and fixing it into the rafters. So, the methods are, are, the, are the same really, but just slightly different fixing methods, you know. You're still thatching in exactly the same way. The end result is still exactly the same as what you'd get either way round. So, you wouldn't know that that wasn't scallop thatched on, you know. That's, it still looks like a traditional, traditional process. That you, 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 the first two courses that are done, you just, it's like a, like a tile roof really. You get your eave in, you get your brow in you get your first course in, you get that solidified. So your whole roof is built off of, off, off of the base really. You know, if you don't get the base set up properly, you can't really thatch the roof up off of it. So, so you have your, your eave, 
your brow, your first course and your second course, then you get all that compacted and then you can start thatching off of it. And then once you get up to the top there, you then knuckle over, you have a roll at the top of the roof and you knuckle over. So you get up to the top there and you basically knuckle over the straw like so. And then once you've got that done, you go around the other side, thatch the other side up and then it knuckles over. You've already got a sealed unit before you've actually put any ridge on there at all because you've got the knuckles that side and then the knuckles that side and they're fixed with spars either side as well. So once you get to that point, we make up the bobbins, which is the twisted knot that see, you see at the top there. So they're then placed over the top of the knuckles and then uh, they're raked out and then you have uh, bamboo or hazel rods to fix it all down. Um, and they're fixed in with uh, uh, hazel, hazel scallops or hazel spars which pin into the, um, into the knuckles that you've already done underneath the bobbins. So then you work from the top and work your way down. So you get all the ridge done, get all the rods clipped up, all the crosses all clipped up, you rake out the roof, you bring it all the way down, you then put on the rods on the eave, clip all that up, and then set your eave out and start cutting like Darren's doing at the minute.